An atmosphere of that gas would give our Earth a high temperature. <laughs> That's a quote from Eunice Newton Foote. She was an amateur scientist in the 1800s who experimented with the heat-trapping abilities of different gases. That quote in particular refers to some work she did measuring the properties of carbonic acid. Good old CO2 and its effect on atmospheric temperatures. That was 1856. Climate change may seem like a thoroughly modern problem, but scientists have been exploring the question of the Earth's climate for over a hundred years. And while those early theories may have been more concerned with predicting ice ages and the outcome of volcanic eruptions, some things they discovered still hold up today. I'm Sarah, and this is The Big Melt. Like, in 1895, there was a Swedish scientist named Savant Arrhenius who, over the course of a hundred thousand calculations and a full year of work, came to the conclusion that if you were to double the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, the Earth would be five to six degrees hotter. His methods may have lacked the sophistication of computer modeling, but he hit it dead on. Hundreds of millions of dollars spent, and a hundred years of research later, and we've basically confirmed what he managed to calculate with a quill and parchment. So, what should we make of this? I mean, other than the fact that the 1800 scientists were pretty boss, I think it's a lesson in listening. History is the story of human nature, what we choose to pursue, whose voices we value. It's a record of our prejudices, our wants, our hopes, Knowing that we knew early and didn't do anything just goes to show that you can have all the information, perfect science, but it doesn't really matter if people aren't willing to listen to it. So the next big question is, how do you get people to listen? And why do they choose not to sometimes? I uh, don't have the answer to that one, but since it seems like, you know, possibly the most important question to the future of humanity ever, I've decided to reach out to Nathaniel Rich. He's a writer of both fiction and uh, nonfiction, and his book, Losing Earth, A Recent History, is all about the existence of scientific evidence for global warming for decades, and the reasons why we collectively failed to listen to it. Let's ask this historian what's happening in the past. Hello? Hi, is this Nathaniel? It is. Hi, this is Sarah speaking. Um, I'm the host of a podcast about climate change called The Big Melt, and uh, I was really hoping I could ask you some questions. I'd love to talk to you. Let's do it. Okay, so I wanted to talk to you about losing Earth. Uh, some of the things you described there are so crazy, and I know you also write fiction, so I was wondering, are parts of it fictional? No, nothing sadly is, is fictional in Losing Earth. It's a pure nonfiction reported narrative piece based on a couple of years of research and more than 100 interviews and all kinds of archival research. I think the key for me is narrative, is storytelling. And I think it's easier for people to not only understand you know, complicated concepts like, like climate change or the politics around climate change, through narrative, but I think it's through narrative that we get a better sense of how we ourselves think about these issues and, and the ways in which these, these larger complex issues touch our own personal lives. So whether I'm writing fiction or nonfiction, I think what's most important is telling a good story. And that's, that's what I tried to do with Losing Earth. And, and I feel that there's, there's great value in doing that. It, it allows the reader to bring their own experience and their own thoughts to their work. Yeah, I can totally see that. Okay, now, here's something I wanted to ask you. I recently talked to my dad about why he and his generation didn't take action to fight climate change sooner, and his answer was basically, we didn't know. Yet, according to your book, we already knew everything we understand today by 1979, including how to stop it. How do you explain that? Yeah, I think there's a, a confusion there with the word we. I, when I say we had this knowledge, I, I'm speaking of us as a species and, and speaking of the people in the highest positions of power 
um, in our governments and, and the scientific community. So, for instance, I would say, you know, we know how far away uh, Neptune is from the Earth, but that doesn't mean that any individual would be able to give you the, the miles off the top of their head. But as a species, as a scientific community, we knew the fundamental science, climate change. We knew what was happening what had happened and what would happen and, and all of the, the devastating ramifications of, of global warming by 1979. And at that point, and this is really the story of, of losing Earth, a small group of people who, who had that information, scientists and people in Pintin, at the heart of, of the American government, started to make an effort to try to solve the problem. Part of that effort was to explain the issue to the public, but it, it wasn't really until the end of the 1980s that it became a major international issue. But, but even as early as 1979 and 1980, you do have articles appearing about it in national, major national publications, and, and you have the beginning uh, of, a, of a solution that's being worked on. That's interesting. So all this time, some people, and even important people, have known about climate change, and we didn't see many actions and public awareness to it until much later. Yes. In your book, you describe the birth of climate denialism and its role in holding off many of the climate change actions. Do you think we're finally starting to see the end of this movement? I think so. I mean, I think by the end of the 80s is, is really when you have a concerted effort um, begun by the oil and gas industry try to confuse the public and so disinformation. And that really has been the story of the last 30 years or so, that this effort has grown and it's taken over American politics and transformed the Republican Party into a, a climate denialist party. I, I do think in the last year, uh, we're starting to see a shift where it's in increasingly less possible for a politician to pretend that this isn't happening and so you're seeing a different kind of argument coming out of those who want to resist climate policy. So, I, I, you know, I think, I think denialism is on the way out. It'll be a gradual process. With, with I'm, I'm sure we'll have resurgences along the way. But that in itself doesn't necessarily mean we're any closer to a solution. Yeah, I guess that's true. That's too bad. Um, okay, so when you were doing research for your book... What's the most infuriating example of misinformation propaganda that you came across? Wow. I mean, there's so much. I think the most sort of nefarious and evil example is, is when the oil and gas companies started mailing, quote, educational videos to schools all over the country in the beginning of the 1990s. And these were indoctrination videos basically trying to convince school children that the science wasn't real or that, that extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was a good thing because plants would grow larger and, and grow more corn and that kind of thing. And so that was morally the most evil. But I think in a different category, one of the most pernicious lies is that this is a new problem. And I think you see that even among some of the leaders of this new youth movement in the last year who demanded change. I think of the U.S., Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez always says, we've known about this problem since 1989, which is the year she was born. She makes a big point of that. You know, we've known about this problem my whole life. And in fact, we've known about this problem much earlier than that. And the basic science of global warming goes back even to the 19th century. So the lie that the industry has tried to sell that this is even a new problem is so pernicious that even those who are fighting hardest to change things have, have managed to absorb it. Yeah, I think those would be the tough too. But I think any kind of uncertainty that remains about the, the need to act is really a byproduct of that, of that campaign. Wow, it's amazing those lies are so strong. Now, I've been doing a lot of research for this podcast, and I find it incredibly difficult. Can you explain about your research process for this type of project? Yeah, I find it incredibly difficult, too. My basic strategy is essentially to not be afraid to be, at least at the outset of a, of a, of a project, to be as, as dumb about it as, as possible. So what that means is, you know, ask every question, even ones that, that seem maybe obvious or stupid, you know, reread things, read as widely as possible, ask lots of people the same questions to make sure that that your understanding is as clear as possible and you know it's a painstaking process and it, when it came to a, a subject like this it took me a long time as i said about a year and a half of research conversations and it's really not until i get to the point where i start to feel like i know as much if not more than the people i'm interviewing that i feel comfortable starting to write 
So that's when I know, when I, when I start asking questions and I have a better sense of the answers than the people I'm asking in many cases. That's when I know I'm, I'm ready to write. But it's really not until then that I feel comfortable doing so. But that's, for me, one of the most exciting things about being a writer is it's a way to learn. Uh, and, I, and I only really write about things that I want to learn more about. And so this was, was a great example of that. Yeah, I also feel like I learn so much. Those are really great tips. Thanks. Okay, so one more question. Living in New Orleans, did the impact of natural disasters or extreme weather influence your writing? Yeah, I mean, I live in New Orleans with my family, and it's, it's one of the places that's most threatened by climate change in the world. You also live here with the daily reminders of, of Hurricane Katrina, which is, you know, 15 years ago just about, and and yet it still feels very much a fabric of of the daily life, it, the trauma of the storm lingers in every aspect of the experience of living here. So, yes, it certainly puts these questions into the forefront of one's mind. And and I think you know it's it in some ways, city of New Orleans, a city with this glorious past and kind of haunted by its past. Uh, in this way, when it comes to climate change, it's really a city of the future because to live in New Orleans today, you have to be aware of the the various threats that we face. And and I think in the same way, most of the world will develop that mindset in the years years to come. Huh, that's an interesting way to look at it. That could be everybody's future if we don't do anything about it. Well, thank you so much, Nathaniel, for answering my questions. Yeah, Yeah, great to speak with you. Thanks for having me on. All right, thanks. Bye. Bye. The Big Bow. Let's take a super quick break for this message. Now let's get back to the pod. It's crazy how similar the past is to the present. We think we're so different, but when you're aware of history, you see patterns playing themselves out again and again. You know, thinking about how a lot of the political resistance to environmental efforts stemmed from a desire to protect industries, I'm really curious how we'll move forward. Like, if the jobs of the past don't really work for the world of the future, what are we even supposed to do when we grow up? In the shift away from traditional industries of the past, it can feel like all these jobs disappeared and we got left with a ton of problems. But if you think about it, that's actually kind of great. Like seriously, what do problems need? Solvers. Greening absolutely every aspect of society is a massive task, and it's going to take an equally massive workforce to achieve it. We're talking about a complete transformation of the world as we know it. New ways of generating power, new types of vehicles, new ways of thinking, and entirely new ways to communicate these brand spanking new ideas. Just look at all the people I've interviewed. Some of them are pioneers of completely new fields. Like they're literally the first people to do their jobs. Think about that for a second. Some of these professions are younger than I am. Julian manages a space age environmentally friendly building. Dr. Perkins studies a field that didn't even exist 50 years ago. Steve Oldham definitely has to be one of the first people to ever run a carbon capture plant. Do you think Kobe thought she'd own a cricket bar business when she was little? If science, technology, design, or theory are your thing, there will be lots for you to do. Like, we need you to do the things. But if you're a more creative, artistic, entrepreneurial, or nurturing type, we still need to imagine new ways of doing older jobs too. Ways that function in harmony with the world instead of exploiting it. Okay, I think I'm ready, but am I ready? (laughs) Well, it is almost unavoidable. It's the last climate myth of the season. Let's do this. But because it is our last climate myth segment, I thought it could be cool to do it a little bit different this time. Don't worry, I'm still going to bust the myth, but that's not going to be the focus. Because this particular myth is a good chance to take a look at certain kind of misinformation and figure out how to spot it. So today's myth is carbon is natural and actually good and we need it. Okay, a little bit of background. 
This myth pops up in all kinds of media, and it's actually a pretty effective argument against environmental efforts because it's a trap. It masquerades as science, but if you try to refute it, you'll have your credentials attacked. Where'd you get your PhD? I'm sorry, are you a scientist? You're just repeating what you heard. You don't actually know. The comment section for articles supporting this myth are total flame wars. And if it seems completely irrational that the deal breaker for people who advance this myth, a myth that completely ignores the general consensus of 99% of scientists, would be whether or not the person they're debating is a scientist, that's the point. This isn't a rational argument. At best, it's an attempt to work backwards from a conclusion and find some way to support it regardless of what the science says. At worst, it's good old-fashioned subterfuge, just a mean attempt to mess with people. Either way, it's a good example of a, shall we say, untruth? Because it's totes obvious. But these sort of things are not always so easy to see. When trying to figure out if something is true or not, an activity I've been doing a whole lot of lately to bust these myths, I've found that it can be really helpful to look at the context as well as content. So, for example, in the case of this carbon myth, the writer who seemed to support it the most is a scientist named Thorpe Watson. And while he actually does have a PhD in physical metallurgy and science of materials, he doesn't use it to support his argument. Instead of making a claim and then using research and data to back it up, he vaguely references the carbon cycle, doesn't explain it in any detail, and then moves on to a litany of other objections to the very idea of climate change, saying things like, the real problem is telling kids about climate change. It's a form of psychological abuse because it makes them anxious. No, wait! Actually, environmentalism is a plot by people who support Trumpian politics to favor American oil over Canadian oil. <laughs> like, which is it, dude? Do you have a real scientific objection? Are you concerned about child welfare? Or have you unearthed some great conspiracy? My money is on none of these, and I'd be very curious to see where his money comes from. But. Other than to point out inconsistencies, I'm not really interested in critiquing Dr. Watson or giving him much attention at all. I want to get to the myth busting. And while I think to say, because carbon is part of the carbon cycle, all carbon is good, is about the same thing as saying, since the human body is 60% water, we should all drink as much water as possible, which BT dubs is really dumb. You can really hurt yourself doing that. I guess my opinion doesn't matter because I don't have a PhD, but I know someone who does though. Dr. Greg Slater teaches geochemistry at McMaster University. He literally teaches a class on biochemical cycles and is a legitimate expert on the topic of carbon cycling, which we touched on briefly in episode 7's climate myth, if you remember. I think it can be helpful to dive a bit deeper into the carbon cycle this time because I think it will help us to understand a bit better what's so utterly wrong about the carbon is good argument. Dr. Greg Slater was a postdoctorate fellow at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, which means after he did all the research for his PhD, he went to work doing even more research. Let's see if he can help us win this comment section flame war. Hello. Hi, is this Dr. Greg Slater? That's me. Hi, um, this is Sarah from The Big Melt. How are you? I'm doing great, Sarah. How are you? I'm doing pretty well myself, thanks. I just wanted to use all your climate expertise to win an argument with strangers on the internet. Right. And also maybe share in my podcast what I've learned. So do you mind if I ask you a few questions? Not at all. Go ahead. Awesome. Okay, so first off, can you tell us a little bit about your research? Yeah, sure. Um, in my research, what I am most interested in is understanding how carbon moves through the environment and what are the most important processes that, that control it. Oh, that's so cool. Okay, so exactly what is carbon cycling? So um, generally speaking, the term carbon cycling is just talking about the fact that carbon, uh, the element carbon, like many elements on Earth, is constantly moving through the environment. It's being changed from one form to another form and back again. Most of these things happening in a cycle and so carbon will be changed from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and dissolved in the oceans 
to mineral forms like calcite and to organic carbon. And organic carbon, that just means the type of carbon that's produced during photosynthesis by plants and algae and, and microbes. Uh, that is the, the organic molecules that make up all of life. So you and me and, and the plants and the animals. Now, I saw some people debating on the internet saying that carbon is natural and good and everything is part of these carbon cycles. If this is true, where's the problem? Ah, okay. So that's a great question. So the thing about uh, the carbon cycle and the organic carbon cycle specifically, um, it's a really important cycle uh, for life. Carbon is is essential. We are all made of carbon. Uh, all of our food is made of carbon. All of the energy we live on is stored in carbon. Um, so carbon itself is not the problem. The thing about carbon is carbon is always cycling, and, and we're actually changing the total amount of carbon that's around. The crucial thing we need to understand is how the different parts of the carbon cycle are functioning. So different parts of the carbon cycle happen at different rates. Um, some things, like when carbon is transformed into minerals, like calcite, that forms limestone rocks, that takes really long time scales. So geologic time, hundreds of thousands of years. But other parts of the carbon cycle, like photosynthesis by plants and, and bacteria, that can be, happen really fast. So you can take CO2 from the atmosphere and you put it into organic carbon. And then we use that carbon and we put it back in. Uh, so we cycle that CO2 from the atmosphere into a plant that we eat as food and we put it back in very quickly. So there's, there's all sorts of ranges of carbon cycling that are happening all the time. What we often are thinking about with climate is the organic carbon cycle. The organic carbon cycle is playing a big role, and especially in the short term, on controlling how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. Essentially, all of the energy and all the carbon that we use, that all living organisms use on the Earth, was created by photosynthesis. And when it does that, it stores the sun's energy in the chemical difference between the reduced carbon or the organic carbon and the oxygen. The thing is over geologic history, what happened was a lot of organic carbon that got produced this way got buried underground. So in the subsurface, into rocks. And so what we discovered some time ago was if we went down and dug up some of that old carbon, coal or petroleum type carbon and brought it to the surface, and recombine it with the oxygen, we could burn it and get the sun's energy back out and use that to do stuff. So that was, you know, essentially the industrial revolution and, and understanding that we could use fossil fuels to get energy to drive our society. Oh, okay, I think I get it now. So the total amount of carbon in this cycle remains the same, but the balance of carbon dioxide in this cycle is shifting. Yeah, exactly. Can you remind us... How does carbon dioxide affect the climate? Yeah, so carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is very important because it absorbs heat. It absorbs the heat energy that the Earth is trying to release back to space. Carbon dioxide is called a greenhouse gas because it absorbs that energy and it actually keeps the atmosphere warm. This is really important for us because if it wasn't doing this, the estimated average temperature of the Earth would be something like minus 15 degrees Celsius. And that is pretty cold, and people generally figure it would be hard for life to survive on Earth if the average temperature was that low. So we need CO2 in the atmosphere and other greenhouse gases to keep the atmosphere warm. But if you have too much CO2 and you get too warm, then you start to have problems. Atmospheric carbon and atmospheric carbon dioxide is really important to keep the planet in a livable or habitable state. Um, but what we are concerned with when we think about climate change is when we start to change that amount of CO2, we change the amount of heat that's being kept into the atmosphere and we can start to warm the atmosphere up. And that warming up is the thing that people are concerned about when they're worried about climate change because if you warm up the atmosphere, you put more energy, you can have things happening like melting of ice caps or more intense storms, things like that. So coming back to the online discussion I saw, it's pretty obvious that some of the people there use inaccurate arguments or even spread misinformation. How is it possible to deal with that, to know what to trust and what not to? 
Uh, well, that's a that's a really good and important question, and it's a difficult one to deal with sometimes, especially you know currently with the internet and social media and other venues. There's a lot of uh, information out there that people can can be told or can get passed on, and it's hard to tell what is actually good information and what is not. So I think that, you know, the, the only ways you can really kind of deal with this is to try and make sure you know what the source of your information is. So if you're getting information or someone's passing you information, you need to track down where that came from originally. Because if it's just something someone made up and decided to send out in a tweet at some point and starts getting passed around, you know, where they got that from or why they wanted to say that, you don't have any idea. Whereas if you can track that down to a source like a study that was published by a government scientist or a researcher somewhere or a media outlet that names the sources it's used in order to get information and you know where that's come from, you can have more confidence that your information is actually correct. Okay, but how is it possible for someone who is not a scientist to understand all of this information? Well, I mean, the thing about science is that anybody can do it. I mean, certainly it takes a long time to learn the, the enough background and enough and enough skill set to do some parts of science. But I think people should generally feel like it's, it's something that is uh, accessible. Uh, I mean, scientists, sometimes we struggle because we use a lot of jargon terms and complex ways of saying things. And we're not doing that to try and make things difficult to understand. It's just that those words and those terms have specific meanings And we're trying to address specific questions. But people should kind of see science as something that, you know, they can learn about and they can participate in. And, you know, if you don't understand some academic paper, there are a lot of uh, outlets and places that are that provide kind of an interpretation of some of those papers that you can go to. So like science magazines or websites that will kind of try and make things clearer for the non expert in that area. That sounds really good. It's much more accessible if it's written in a language that anyone can understand. Well, yeah, scientists are trying to get better at doing that, I think. Yeah, that's really important. Maybe it'll also make people think about things before they write inaccurate comments. Yep. So what do you wish people knew about your field of study? Um, I mean, I think that I wish people knew that the Earth is a complex system and that they recognize that materials and energy are always moving and cycling through that system and that we are a part of that and that our activities are part of that. And we can, you know, be active and have a modern society within this environment that is cycling this way. Um, if we do it responsibly, we don't have to degrade the rest of the environment. We just have to take action to make sure what we're doing is responsible and respectful of the environment around us. Yeah, totally. Well, thank you so much for sharing all that. Oh, no problem at all. It was great. Thanks. Yeah, great talking to you. All right, bye. Bye. This myth has been professionally busted. That's really cool. I think that's actually what I've realized more and more while making each of the climate myth segments. All the information is there. And the good information, not the misinformation. Each one of us can Google and look for good sources. Sometimes you'll have to rely on someone else to explain it in simpler words, but people like Dr. Slater do that all the time. So we can theoretically know a lot about a topic before posting it online. And we have to do this. I mean if we want to have meaningful discussions. Wow, we're here at the end. You know, I started this podcast with that feeling that we're going towards an unavoidable tipping point, that after passing it, everything would just collapse, that the world will end in 10 years and nobody cares, that nobody does anything to stop it, although everyone knows what we have to do. I blamed everyone, the people who don't believe that climate change is real, world leaders and governments, even my parents. But honestly, I mostly blamed myself and felt like I have no power to change anything. And all I can do is watch it happen. But over the course of recording these episodes, I got to speak with experts and understand this situation better than I ever have. I've researched up and coming tech, scientific advancements, government plans, 
I've spoken to business owners, academics, even the Minister of the Environment. And most importantly, I've gotten to listen to teens from all around the world who feel the same way I do, and who started to act and get their voice heard. So, I don't feel the same anymore. I almost feel hope. And this hope, even if it's small and fragile right now, if each one of us holds onto it and we reach out to each other, it'll grow. And you know, we can all be a part of it, across countries, across generations. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen in the future, how everything will unfold, if robots will save us, or if we find a way to connect back to nature. But I am more sure than I ever have been that we're not out of time, that we can handle it together. Right, Kyle? Kyle? Yep. Hey, you okay? You've been unusually quiet. I I got through a whole episode. Yeah, I just kind of said it's all done. You big dork, it's not all done. Do you think just because we finished ten episodes and this is technically the end of our first season, we can lean back and, like, retire? No way! There's always more we can learn. Endless myths to bust. Cool people to meet. Yeah. The fight for the planet never ends. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right. So, listeners, make sure you're subscribed to the feed and check back in for regular updates. We already have a couple of cool bonus episodes planned that will be coming your way soon. You can also follow Earth Rangers on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for updates on the Big Melt. Hey, can I do the sign-off? Uh, sure. All right, this is my time. This is Kyle time. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, sis. Hey, guys, this is the Big K. For Kyle, the, the case for Kyle. Signing off for the big melt. We'll be back for season two, even bigger, even meltier. And until then, I say farewell. But since I'm here uh, and I got the mic, I want to tell you about Kyle and the Mutant Plastic Munchers, the new punk band coming out this 2020. We're a great new band coming out with a new single. It's about um, being good with the environment because apocalypse is happening. Everybody, undercover. Okay, bye. Please watch me show. Lord, that was a mistake. <laughs> Later, peeps. The Big Melt Podcast is brought to you by Earth Rangers. It was written by Lee Lawson, directed by Stefan Richter, and edited by Nitai Steinberg. Production support by Avni Sandu, with help from Haley Saramaki and Alex Georgievich, and additional recordings by Mikey Tachek. The cast was Michael Hogan as Sarah's dad, Louis Plana as Kyle, and me, Sarah Marks. Special thanks go to Bill Litschauer, the VP of Programs at Earth Rangers, and Tova Barakas, president of Earth Rangers. The Big Melt was developed and produced with funding from Environment and Climate Change Canada's Climate Action Fund. <laughs>